Welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. Here we are. It is April 1st, 2017. Doing a weekend update here. Well, what did we see this last week in trade? Well, first and foremost, I'm actually going to start with a more convoluted area of trade. And I talked about this a, a bit earlier in the week, and I'm going to elaborate upon it a bit more. Then we're actually going to do uh, just a quick rewind on what we actually saw this past week in the S&Ps, maybe a little bond discussion, and then really going to be very forward-looking as we typically are on a weekend to weekend basis here in these weekend updates. So to start with, what you're looking at right now is a quote on the volatility futures. Now, if you're if you're not looking at the volatility futures, you should, okay? It, it takes a bit of getting used to looking at volatility futures because the volatility futures themselves, okay, they have expirations because there's futures contracts. And as the contract grows closer to expiration, it uh, feels like, of course, it's decaying because there's less risk the closer you get to expiration. And uh, the way to kind of map this out, and it's a this is just a really important concept to understand in today's marketplace, but here's a volatility future with 18 days left. If you look at it with 18 days left, all right, so you've got 18 days of risk left in this, and it's trading for, you know, 13, roughly 27, okay? As time goes on and as the date moves on, less days equate to slightly less risk because the future becomes more known the less time you have, if that makes sense, right? So the world, well, the world can get crazy in 90 days because there's so much uncertainty in 90 days, but with only 18 days left, there's a little bit what? A little bit less risk. So the way to look at the volatility futures is, so we have an 18-day volatility future, and this is the one I wanna elaborate upon for just a moment. Why am I starting with this on the weekend update? is because for unknown reasons, the volatility future really got bid up. That means there were pretty hefty buyers of the volatility future on what was a you know, quiet Friday. The S&P sold off a little bit towards the close, but it's been bothersome because it was also there okay, on Thursday, which I'll show you here in a moment. So that's the 18-day volatility future. Now, there's other volatility futures, but they just don't trade really any volume, so we kind of exclude them, okay? Jump to the next primary contract, okay? And that primary contract is the May, and the May has got 46 days. Now, what I was pointing out earlier this week, the distance, and that is the pricing distance between April and May right now is extraordinarily tight, okay? Let's call it, it's somewhere between 30, okay, to 40 cents. And that's oscillating a little bit. When I say 30, 40 cents, like literally like the pricing difference, you know, we'll say 13.30, this is about what? Oh, 13.60, I'm just rounding over here. So it was bouncing yesterday between 30 and 40 cents. Now, why is that unusual, okay? Because, well, more recently, what have we seen? When volatility meaning the VIX and, you know, the, the SPX. And when volatility has been this low, we've actually seen the pricing differential anywhere from 90 cents on up to about a dollar 10. Okay. Meaning the April's versus the May's or, you know, the previous contract March versus April, the pricing difference in a lower volatility climate is typically much wider between short duration and longer duration. And so is it disconcerting? Yeah, you better believe it's disconcerting. And I don't have that much of a reason, okay, other than, you know, I, I involved in like volatility arbitrage over the years, but it increases the probability, okay, of a bit more chaos in a marketplace, right? Somebody obviously believes there's risk. And the interesting thing is they see the risk in the next 18 days. And another way to show this, this is what they call a depth chart. And this is what I was showing again. It was actually Wednesday of this previous week. And in this depth chart here, if you take a look at the volatility futures, first of all, what are you really looking at? This curve right here where my mouse is on, that is now. That's a curve from now. This curve over here, 
okay? And I'm actually gonna show you that curve over there, that's set back to March 20th. So why did I actually use March 20th? I used March 20th because it was the day before we had a decent sell-off because I wanna show you something changed in volatility drastically on March 21st and it has not reverted back. So all of a sudden, you know, you see this week go by and this week everybody's like, ah, oh, it, it was kind of boring, you know, we got through this past week kind of unscathed, nothing really happened. But the volatility futures are telling a, uh, just a very, very different story and they haven't normalized. So this is now, and again, what you're looking at is, as I said, that's that 1327 right here and that's the April contract. Here is the May contract. Okay, just a few pennies higher than that. What's more normal is this. What's this? This is a, you know, on what? On March 20th, okay? On March 20th, you can see the short duration contract sitting about 1320. The longer duration contract is sitting almost at 1420. See, there's almost a point between them. So 30 cents is very, very tight. And what that means, again, to to not go too deeply into this but what it ultimately means is trade is highly uncertain in the here and now it's the only explanation for it so they keep the volatility futures pumped up all right and if you look at this even on percentage terms all i did is just change this chart to a percentage term and again this is what they call a depth chart uh you can see the differential in percentage terms is vast right so right now there's like a 2.5 percent difference between ape and may Okay, uh, on March 20th, there was as much as uh, an 8%, 7 to 8% differential between front and back. So again, very, very large kind of discrepancy here that is unexplained in the volatility futures. And, you know, of course, your question is, well, what would explain it? Sell side activity. Okay, somebody's bidding for volatility at this point. Somebody, I mean, who's the somebody? Now, do I see anything in confluence with that? So let's switch gears a little bit, get off the volatility futures. I just think it's incredibly important because there are people risking, you know, millions and millions of dollars every day in markets, obviously, and they've never even looked at the volatility future. And the volatility future right now, it's the only thing on the screen that's displaying like, you know, risk. Now, as I said, we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna look a little bit more at equity products. First and foremost, let's look at the SPX. The SPX, and I've got a two-year chart open here, but the SPX, what did it really do uh, just over the last couple of trading sessions? So what did we see this week? You count back, here's Friday, Thursday, you know, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. Monday was kind of wild pretty much before the cash opened. And uh, for those of you that don't watch S&P Futures, you know, I know the week closed at, you know, 23.62 and 23.57 respectively in the S&P Futures. But if you missed it earlier in the week, those futures traded all the way down to 2317. Okay. Now that's a little disconcerting. The range this week is phenomenal. Was it to the upside? Absolutely. But a phenomenal range that we saw this week, most of it being, of course, on Monday and, uh, and Tuesday. So again, everybody's looking at the marketplace, trying to anticipate the next move, which I'm going to talk about here momentarily. Before I get there, I want to look at bonds. Because bonds to me, this is the this is the most pivotal area uh, for me in trading right now. The bonds are really dictating a tremendous amount of the order flow out there. In fact, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to contract adjust the bonds just to see kind of the pivotal area. Um, here we are trading right around this 151 level. Okay, and it's it's this is again regardless of what you may think about bonds, it doesn't matter. All right, interest rates are going higher or lower <laughs> because interest rates have done nothing but over the past two weeks interest rates as the bonds rallied interest rates have actually gone lower the only thing that we know inside of bonds definitively we're at a really pivotal place okay we don't even know why but we know right around this 151 level inside of the zb which literally okay the week closes 150 and 31 ticks for those of you who don't know what ticks means if you hit 32 ticks, well, that takes us to 151. There's 32 ticks to a one-point move. So we basically close at the most pivotal place in the bond product. Now, why do I say that? I mentioned this also earlier in the week. The bonds just crest a little bit higher. It's going to be night-night time inside of the financial. The financials go, we all go, right? Now, 
there's something obviously going on inside of the financials. I'm going to take you right there. I mean, the bonds, it's that easy. The bonds rally, it's going to take the S&Ps lower. The bonds sell off over there. All right, we might meander in this, this neighborhood and we're going to keep a very, very close eye on bonds moving forward. But I don't mind telling you, like, listen, the bonds, they're a coin flip away from rocking the markets, which might kind of make sense why we're actually seeing volatility futures get bit up a little bit. Other traders is looking at the exact same thing. They're like, oh, those bonds, those things get above 151. It's all over. And uh, I'm a little suspect on that one. I think, again, it's a 50-50 shot out there in support and resistance. Yeah, well, at 151, it's, uh, it's a coin flip. With the XLF, let's go look at the financials themselves. Some of them are off from the 25 level. They cruise down to 23, hard and fast over here. Again, on a percentage basis, it's, uh, you know, Mr. Toad's wild ride. And again, this is on a percentage basis from kind of peak to trough there from uh, 37% down here to 24%, but it's a nice bounce, okay? These bounces though that we're seeing right now, uh, that's a hallmark that could be sold into. And I mentioned this earlier in the week, okay? We called the 24 level. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not a technical trader, but we called the 24 level and we said, well, we're likely to come back up to 24 and revert back down from there, okay? Well, a little bit of reversion back down, uh, eight tenths of a percent came off on Friday. Quite entertaining. Nevertheless, I think that the financials, they're waiting for the pivotal move up in bonds. And I don't think the financials are gonna come off much more unless bonds get above that 151 level. So again, substantiates the bonds. Speaking of financials over here, I, I wanna reiterate in Goldman Sachs on a percentage basis, Goldman Sachs, I think this is off everybody's radar screen, but this thing's getting clobbered. All right, that's 72%. That's the absolute peak over here. Down here, you realize it's only up, what, 49%. So uh, some quick and dirty math over there. That's a huge move. We're looking at a 20% decline. Again, from this peak to trough over there, it's a 20% decline. Substantial enough for you? Sure, there's a bounce back over here. This bounce right now inside of Goldman Sachs, again, it looks like a hallmark of you know, what is evidence of more sell side activity that's coming. And we're going to look for that. And again, I think this next week is fairly pivotal. I think the bonds are going to make that upward move. Now that's my own bias. I'm telling you right now, the bonds, they're a coin flip away from trading higher. If they trade higher. You got a very high probability of the S and P's and the, uh, being taken down by the financials. Now, Again, switching gears a little bit, I'm going to go over to the energy sector. The energy sector also has that same kind of hallmark. It's what we call in traders term, like the rip your face off rally. Okay. So for those of you not watching the energy sector lately, uh, here we are up about 15%. Okay. It's had about a 15% sell off with uh, ultimately about a, you know, two to 3% bounce over here. Again, what I'm looking at when I say these hallmarks, in the midst of down moves, people seldom realize that some of the largest percentage moves in the midst of a down move, some of the largest percentage, uh, percentage moves are actually to the upside. And again, we saw some of the you know, hallmarks of this is a, a more you know bearish rally out there. And it's, it's definitely too early to you know surmise that that's it, you know, the market's over. Now, big broader stuff. Okay, let's go back to the SPX for just a second. And I, you know, if you're not even comfortable with the SPX, tell you what, we'll even go to the spiders because there's a, a big article that came out and the article is actually in reference to the Dow specifically, but I, I could not, and it's not often, I don't read a tremendous amount, you know, in markets, but it's not often I, I you know, I totally agree with, with uh, you know, sentiment of, uh, uh, again, mass media out there. Nevertheless, there was a great point that was made just regarding the entire marketplace. And again, it was in reference to the Dow. So uh, I'll go to the Dow and jump back to the spiders here. But if you haven't looked at this in the last, uh, again, well, since the market ultimately had some sell side activity, and again, we're just back here in early 2016, all right, let me just take this off for just a second, the show prices percentage, but you're looking at a Dow roughly at 15,500. Here's a Dow, okay, up at uh, 21,000 and change. You know, so is, I don't know, almost 5,000 point move in the Dow, is, is that not large enough for you? Okay, even right here today, you know, you're over a 4,000 point move in the Dow. 
And, and what are we looking at? 15, 15 months? I mean, again, turn this into a percentage basis. You were down 12% over here. And I'm just going to zoom in again. I just want to look from the, the, you know, this trough to the peak over here for a moment. But you were down 12%. You're up 16%. Okay, so it's had a 25% run. That's the Dow. Let's go over and look at the spiders in a similar time frame, in the exact same similar time frame on a percentage basis. The S&Ps were down about 12%. They're up about 14% right now. Great. You guys see where I'm going with this? I mean, on a percentage basis, this thing has been uninhibited. Other than a, you know, a couple of like brief snafus. It was Brexit. I got nervous for the election. It's nothing but upside. And legitimately, we're looking here, and again, this one I've zoomed in, this is slightly beyond a year. All right, we just finished, you know, Q1 over here, but um, this has been a straight run. We were down 12%. This is a two-year chart, down 12% over two years. Now we're actually up 14%. Oh, if the spiders is not good enough for you, well, let's bring in pretty much the mother of all rallies in here, and that happens to be none other than the what? The Qs. All right, technology down 10%, now up 26%. We're looking at a 35% move straight up. And at some point, and I always will remind you of this, yes, I'm carrying bearish positions, but I want to take all like opinion. This is not going to be like a big op-ed piece over here. All opinion out of it, okay? As If you're involved in markets, forget about even short duration trading. If you're short duration trading, that's fine. You know, you're making decisions for this next week. As I said, this next week, you know, you're a 50-50 coin flip for making a, a pretty serious move down in the S&Ps accordance with what's going on inside of the bond market, but in a longer duration. Okay. And a lot of times when you're, you know, you're listening to us here at TheoTrade, you know, you're worried about short term, short term, next week, this week, that week, but time out for a second. I want you to focus on, you know, go look at your 401k for a second because you have tendency to, you know, uh, what should I say, sacrifice, okay? Looking at the 401k, your IRA, oh, it's longer duration stuff. But what's the risk reward? And for that, I'm going to go back over to the uh, to the spiders for just a moment. You know, what's the, what's the legitimate upside potential at this point in the S&Ps versus the downside risk, regardless of what you think markets are going to do? And at some point, you know, when you, when you start backing up over three years, okay, and you start to put things, you know, in percentage terms over here and you, you know, you recognize this has been, all right, in just slightly over a year, what, a 30% move inside of the spiders, I, I, you know, at that point, uh, and again, if you want to look from absolute, you know, bottom to the absolute top over here, it's even beyond that you start to have to wonder how much upside is left and forget about everything you might know about the markets. Forget about valuation. Okay. Who cares about Snapchat and every other news story that's out there. You'll always be able to find bad news on markets right now. Subprime auto loans. I don't know if you guys have looked at that subprime auto loans though. They're degrading yada, yada, yada. Who cares? What matters? Okay. Is a 30% move in one direction okay, isn't statistically reasonable to begin with. And at some point you have to look at this and you have to assess and say, Hey, I need to protect my longer duration investments. Because if you're questioning right now, what the next move of the S and P's are going to be, I don't think that you're looking at a big enough chart. Well, it's the next move of the S and P going to be, I don't know. Look at a five-year chart. I'm going to have to go ahead and go out on a limb over here and say, it's not going to be favorable for much more upside potential. I would never discount, never discount the possibility of more upside. I would never discount that. However, at this point in time, without unequivocation, I can tell you there's a lot more downside risk. If that comes to fruition, how serious it could be is the only question. And that's something I want to really leave you with on here and do your own homework. But when you start looking at a five-year chart, okay, and this is, you know, well out of the side of the financial crisis, this is well off the bottom, but a product that goes from 127, okay, to 240. And then you realize, people, that's the S&P 500, okay? What have you done for me lately, S&P 500, okay? It's a pretty daunting task to talk about risk-reward. 
but you have to recognize how vast some of the downside risks happen to be. We keep seeing explosions to the upside in the market. You're one tweet away, one tweet away from a 10 to 15% decline inside of the S&Ps. And you have to determine if that's going to be, you know, is the juice at this point worth the squeeze? And to me, the answer is, and again, without unequivocation, absolutely not. Thanks everybody for joining us here at Theotrade. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.